Hello everyone, I'm Thomas Piemonte and welcome to another episode of Nerd Culture. As we begin our 2021-2022 school year here at Oceanside High School, so many new updates about movies, shows, and media in general are constantly announced. As we reel away from the beginning of the pandemic and now that vaccines are being widely distributed, it seems as if we are approaching a hopeful state of safety here in Oceanside. Although we're not out of the clear just yet, we could still keep our heads up, stay strong in spirit, and look to the bright future ahead of us. As people have adjusted their lives over the past year, many media distributors have done the same. Since the restrictions have limited the crowding in common areas for a while, entertainment companies have found new ways to allow their audiences to watch their favorite movies and shows safely while having new releases. Here is Sam Farsky to tell us more. The movie theaters have now opened up after being shut down during the lockdown. It's very exciting to hear, especially as a movie lover like myself. While being locked indoors, people have lots of time to watch new TV shows coming out. The top two most popular this year were Squid Game and Made. Both can be streamed on Netflix. Here's a list of the top 10 performing movies of this year. Marvel had a marvelous year, with pulling in the top two most successful movie spots. The number one spot was Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings. It came in with over $217 million earned in the box office. Number two was the long-awaited Black Widow, starring Scarlett Johansson, with over $183 million. Number three was F9 The Fast Saga. It came with over $173 million. Number four was another Marvel movie starring Tom Hardy, Venom, Let There Be Carnage. It came in with over 168 million. Number five was The Quiet Place Part Two, starring Emily Blunt and John Krasinski. It came in with over 160 million. Number six was Free Guy, starring Ryan Reynolds, which came in with over 120 million. Number seven was Jungle Cruise, starring Emily Blunt and Dwayne The Rock Johnson, which came in over 116 million. This was Emily's second time in the top 10 of this year. Number eight was Godzilla vs. Khan, which came in with over 99 million. Number nine was No Time to Die, which is Daniel Craig's last James Bond film. It came in with over 99 million, just shy of the number eight spot. And the number 10 spot was Cruella, which came in with over 86 million. If you're still a bit insecure about going back to the movies, something that might settle you is the Washington Post put up an article that said, if you feel uncomfortable when you get to the theater, AMC notes on its website that you can ask for a refund which is a good thing to hear considering we are still in a pandemic. If after all that you still don't feel comfortable, there are plenty of alternatives you can use. Streaming services became very big in the past couple years, like Hulu, Netflix, Prime Video, and many more. This gives you the opportunity to watch all your favorite shows and movies while still being in the comfort of your own home. HBO Max and Disney Plus Premier Access gives you the ability to watch some of the movies as soon as they drop in theaters and doesn't make you have to wait until they're out on regular access programs. My favorite movie of the year was Black Widow. After being pushed back multiple times and being the first Marvel movie since 2019 to be released, it was a great welcome back to the theaters. We want to know, what was your favorite movie of the year? Comment your top pick down below. It's interesting to know about all the updates going on with distributors and what they've done to allow their audiences to stay entertained. Even before the events of the past year, audiences have found themselves excited about new releases, including movies, shows, and video games. Special events are commonly held to popularize these announcements and build hype around them. Here is Michael Garcia to, to tell us about DC fandom and the Matt Reeves, the Batman. Hey everyone, Michael Garcia here and welcome. Now, today I wanted to talk about this year's recent DC fandom. Last year, the DC fandom debuted on December something, I don't know, but it was in December, and in that, they showcased a lot of different new DC things that were coming up. Aquaman 2, Flash 2, uh, were there any other sequels? I don't know. And of course, something that a lot of people were hyped about, was Matt Reeves' new film, The Batman, that he was going to work on. And there was a lot of excitement around this film. People were speculating certain scene ideas. People were raving on about the cast that was announced. Uh, some good, you know, opinions. Some, some not great. You know, some people weren't super big of a fan of the guy from Twilight being the next Batman. So this year, DC Fandom debuted in October, October 16th, there we go, I remember. And a couple new things were announced. We got a new look at The Flash 2, a little bit of a look at the Michael Keaton Batman appearance and some speculation going around with 
that we got a little bit more news on some other things like the new Rocksteady Suicide Squad game. A lot of people felt this way where this year's DC fandom wasn't as strong as last year's. They didn't feel as if there was a lot of hype around it. But I believe that a lot of people felt the same when they talked about the Batman. I am very, very excited to see what they're gonna do with this. They gave us a small behind the scenes look, you know, some shots of Robert Pattinson uh, with the suit on, without the suit on. Matt Reeves gave us a little bit more of a vibe of what he's bringing to the table with his new Batman movie. But this time you also have Robert Pattinson and Zoe Kravitz joining them. And they talked a lot about some very interesting things. Robert Pattinson apparently in his screen test audition actually auditioned in the Val Kilmer Batman suit, which is really interesting. And I kind of want to know how we got access to that. Zoe Kravitz talked a little bit more about her Catwoman character who she wanted Catwoman to be in this movie, not just like, you know, not just a regular thief, but someone who does what they do to kind of represent their community, I guess. That gave me some year, you know, Batman year one vibes uh, as to what they might do with the Catwoman character. They're definitely gonna change it up a bit. Matt Reeves is gonna do it in his own way. And then Robert Pattinson spoke about how the Batman character was something that he was very interested in for you know a long time and Matt Reeves you know was telling people that hey he was working on Batman and he had Robert Pattinson as the role but he didn't know if Pattinson would agree to it and turns out Pattinson had been thinking about playing Batman for a while now it was really interesting to hear you know the two cast members and Matt Reeves talk about the film and just the passion they have for it is is what's getting me excited just something about how passionate Matt Reeves is about this project stands out to me and I'm looking forward to seeing what he does, you know, writing wise with the different characters. And then after they were done talking in their panel, they gave us a look at the new Batman trailer. I watched the trailer and the trailer just got me so much more excited. Paul Dano as Riddler is just a great, just a, a wonderful casting choice. Paul Dano is definitely one of my favorite actors of all time. He's been in a lot of great films and I'm excited to see him as an iteration of the Riddler character. One where it's not super jokey like the Jim Carrey version, although I, I kind of like the Jim Carrey version, I'm not gonna lie. We got some good shots of, not good shots, great shots of Greg Frazier's cinematography for the film. Greg Frazier recently did the cinematography for the new Dune film. The, this movie just looks amazing. The shots are very well shot. The colors are vibrant when they need to be. It just fits for the tone of this film. And of course, we got more looks at Robert Pattinson's Batman. And just like the last time we saw in the last two trailers, we got the teaser trailer where it was just a suit reveal and the other teaser trailer where we saw a little bit of him. It just gets me more excited for Robert Pattinson as Batman. I know a lot of people remember him for the Twilight movies, but that was when he was young. And honestly, Robert Pattinson has done so many great films after you know, Twilight. He's been in so many great things. He was in Good Time, which is a great film. He was in The Devil All the Time, which was another great film that came out recently that I think is a bit underrated. And he's just a fantastic actor. Seeing Robert Pattinson and his skills in acting, it just gets me more excited to what he's gonna bring to the table as Bruce Wayne. And one more thing I wanna mention is the small score moments that are presented in the trailer. You start off with this small score moment, you know, you know, showing off Riddler, and apparently Riddler does <laughs> latte art, which is pretty cool. That'd be a cool thing to have. And then about halfway through the trailer, they switch to Michael Giacchino's Batman theme. Michael Giacchino is one of my favorite film composers of all time. He's done the MCU Spider-Man movies, he did The Incredibles, and now he's doing The Batman. And I'm really excited to see what he does. Many people are talking about it online and a lot of people agree that this theme has already become iconic. For every Batman iteration, I think that the music has always been great, 
And I believe that Michael Giacchino is just continuing that trend of just creating a, just a great theme for Batman, iconic, you know, dark, but heroic at the same time. And I think Michael Giacchino is gonna do a great job scoring this film. I didn't even mention Colin Farrell as Penguin, who looks <laughs> nothing like Colin Farrell. And I gotta say the makeup for that is just, like I can't, no one can recognize him. No one can recognize him. Like he does not <laughs> look like Colin Farrell. He looks like a completely different person. At the end of the day, I personally am just so, so, so excited to see the Batman in theaters in March on the big screen, seeing everything that Matt Reeves has to offer, seeing all the amazing acting talent. The Batman is definitely one of my most anticipated films that is going to come out next year. And I'm just excited to see another iteration of the Batman come to a new light. Thank you all so much for joining me today. I hope you're as hyped for the Batman as I am. And now we go back to the studio. Thank you, Michael. As each month passes, new films are released that the public have been waiting for. Every month, different genres of movies are released for the public to enjoy. The 2018 film Halloween was released to good reception from the fans of the franchise. The film was meant to be a soft reboot and a sequel to John Carpenter's first Halloween that was released back in 1978. Now the sequel, Halloween Kills, has finally been released after much anticipation. Here's Anthony Verdino joining us to talk about the film. Hello, I'm Anthony Verdino and I'll be sharing my thoughts on the most recent Halloween franchise new release, Halloween Kills. Many dedicated Halloween viewers watch these movies to see the boogeyman do what he does best, send chills down your spine with his terrifying atmospheric presence and brutal approach to murdering his victims while the score of the film swells. On that front, the movie delivers in spectacularly gory fashion. This is easily one of the goriest of the franchise, so sensitive viewers, beware. Due to modern horror and how experimental it has been recently, there are some unique additions to this installment that really cut deep to me. There are impressive sequences sliced throughout where the film flashes back to Halloween night of 1978, and due to the art direction and filtering of lighting for the scenes, the filmmakers were able to nail that 70s movie vibe perfectly. In terms of other new ideas, the movie leaves right where the original left off. The plot eventually focusing on the town coming together as a community to kill Michael Myers in a sort of mob formation. This leads the movie to produce a surprisingly thoughtful commentary on mob culture, showing how crazy and chaotic it could get if someone like Michael really existed, and not even just people, but masses found out and retaliated. The overarching flaw that affects the experience is the movie somewhat falls into obvious middle chapter syndrome. You know there's one more movie to go, so not everything will be fully resolved, making the film feel sort of empty or like filler. Overall though, if you're looking for a festive slasher that will fill that spooky season viewing void, this is certainly enough bloody soaked fun. I would give it a 6 out of 10. This is Anthony Verdino with your movie report. Let's send it back to the studio. Well that's all the time we have for today. Be sure to subscribe to the Sailor Station Broadcasting YouTube channel for more broadcasts, updates, and special episodes such as this. If you enjoyed our broadcast today, be sure to share with your friends and hey, maybe even your family. Thank you so much for joining us in another episode of Nerd Culture. We hope you'll join us next time for our next broadcast. And remember, for all things Sailor Nation, we are the Sailor Station.